Hey, good morning. Uh, good morning again to all of you, to those of you who especially who braved the rain uh, this morning to get here and to be uh, together physically. Welcome also to those of you who are joining us online. Uh, we're glad to be together in the ways that we're able to be together this morning for worship. We're continuing in the Gospel of Matthew this morning. Uh, if you recall, way back at the end of July, we began a journey through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is chapters 5, 6, and 7 in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, before Christmas, during the season of Advent, during those several weeks, we spent several uh, weeks in, the chap in chapter 1 of Matthew's Gospel, which is what happens before Jesus' birth. Then after or since Christmas, we've spent, this will be our third Sunday in chapter 2, which immediately follows Jesus' birth in Matthew's narrative. We are going to return to uh, the Sermon on the Mount next Sunday, but I think we've got one more uh, kind of uh, thing to see and study and talk about in chapter 2 before we jump back into the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so uh, trusting that God has something again for us in chapter 2, and with that hope, uh, let's pray and ask God to help us. God, we've made it here. Uh, we've, some of us at home, have our TVs on or our devices open. Uh, we thank you for the chance to be together and to sing and to pray and to be led in prayer and to be prayed for with one another. We ask now that as we open your word again together that you would give us eyes to see and ears that are good to hear. Help us to be fully available to you and attentive that you might impart to us grace and truth and that we might be shaped into the likeness and the image of your son, our Lord Jesus. I pray and ask that as my words are true to your word, that they be taken to heart. If my words stray or deviate in any way from your word or the spirit of your word, may they be quickly forgotten. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now reading from uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1 for the third time, the last time uh, before we jump back to the Sermon on the Mount. Listen closely. This, we believe, is the word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east in Jerusalem uh, came, to, came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. He was troubled, frightened, alarmed. And all Jerusalem with him. When King Herod had called together all the chief, people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Uh, notice the Magi said, King of the Jews, Herod asks about Messiah. In Bethlehem of Judea, they reply, for this is what the prophet Micah has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house... They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And as you may have picked up from my intonation in reading those 12 verses... Our focus this morning is going to be on why the Magi came. The Magi state, we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. And then so important in Matthew's narrative and for the Magi was their worship of this child king, that King Herod, picking up on that, says back to the Magi, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may worship him. Of course, that's not his intention. 
But Matthew wants us to hear that. And then verse 11. On coming to the house, the Magi saw the child Jesus with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And I thought to myself as I read this again this week, how odd this is in some ways. The Magi were not Christians. The Magi were not even Jews. They were, as I said last week, stargazers, astrologers, interpreters of dreams. They were seekers of truth. They were teachers. They were likely wise people. They may have also been magicians or sorcerers or physicians or priests. The ancient word magi could mean any of those things. In fact, the verb form of this very same word is used in chapter 8 of the book of Acts where it is interpreted or translated magician or sorcerer or as a verb form, one who practices magic or sorcery. And so what are these guys doing in Matthew's account, and what were they simply doing? Yes, they traveled a long, lay, a long way, but they were not, as many of you who have been to Israel, were on a vacation tour to the Holy Land. They were not there to sightsee. They were not there to take pictures that they could post on social media. They weren't there to check a box. This wasn't on their bucket list. They weren't doing reconnaissance for a foreign country or empire. They weren't there because they were curious. They were there to worship, and specifically to worship Jesus. Matthew is emphatically and intentionally clear about this in the narrative. They were there for one purpose. They had one mission, to worship Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but my experience growing up in church, in my experience, worship was the way we referred to our time spent in the sanctuary on Sunday morning like this, worship. But in retrospect, being in a sanctuary, just and simply being in a sanctuary makes someone a worshiper of God or a worshiper of Jesus as much as being in a garage makes someone an automobile. That's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. The Greek verb translated in chapter 2 of Matthew's gospel as worship is proskuneo, and it means to worship, to pay homage, to show reverence, to adore, all verbs, action words. And it is almost always an act of the will. I'll say that again. It's almost always an act of the will Intentional and an act of the heart. Action, act, will. To worship someone or to worship something is to put that someone or that something on a pedestal. To highly honor that person or that thing. To give it or to give them a place of elevated allegiance in one's life. And everyone worships something. Or everyone worships someone. That's just the way we're wired, the way we're built, the way it is. And if you want to know what it is that you worship, there are ways to find out. Look at the stubs of your checkbook. Look at your credit card statement. Look at the things on your calendar and your schedule. How do you spend your money? How do you spend your time? What do you spend your time thinking about? What are your eyes on? Who are you watching? What are you watching? Who or what has your attention? To what or to whom have you given? Do you give your best attention? So everyone has a throne in their life. Everyone has a throne in their life. And there is likely one primary purpose or per person or one primary thing on that metaphorical throne. It may be another person, it may be a friend, it may be a child, it may be a spouse, someone you want to be your spouse, it may be a hero, it may be a role model, it may be an idol, or it may be oneself. Sometimes the hardest thing for some people to do is to get off the throne of their own life. 
or it may be a thing on the throne of your life. A house, a car, a job, a career, one's reputation, money, wealth, possessions, knowledge, education, degrees, a car, a job, a career, security, respect, health, one's body, clothes, fashion, sports, leisure, time, recreation, travel, a place, a hobby, food, or something to which one is addicted, you fill in the blank for you. But in the book of Revelation, there's one piece of furniture, and it's a throne, and on the throne is the Lord, and the Lord alone. To what or to whom have you given, or do you give, do I give, do we give, the highest place in our lives? To what or to whom do we effectively pay homage Or do we honor or admire or adore? Who or what has your attention, your time, your affections, your dollars? The Magi came from the East to worship Jesus. They were likely dignified men, probably respected, respectable, comfortable. They had resources. They had freedom. They had access. They had choices. And they came to worship the one who had been named king of the Jews, born king of the Jews. But they weren't even Jews again. And yet they come, came seeking one who somehow had come, they had come to believe was worthy of their worship. Worthy of them placing him on the throne of their lives, in their lives, giving him gifts, them bowing down to him and before him. And to worship something or someone is to affirm its great value, to acknowledge its lofty character, to see that thing's glory, and to to ascribe to it praise. Oswald Sanders described worship like this, the loving ascription of praise to God, who he, who is in himself and in his providential dealings, good in every way. It is the bowing of our innermost spirits before him in deepest humility and reverence. Worship is the adoring contemplation of God as he has been pleased to reveal himself in his Son and in the Scriptures. Worship is a believer's response to God's revelation of himself. It is expressing wonder, awe, and gratitude for the worthiness, the greatness the goodness of the Lord, it is the appropriate response to God's person, his provision, his power, his promises, his plan. Response to. And worship is the believer's loving response with all that he or she has. Mind, emotions, will, body, to all that God is, does, and says. Quoting the Shema in the book of Deuteronomy, Jesus says the most important of all of the laws in the Old Testament is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and mind and soul and strength, all of your faculties, all of your resources, all that you have, all that you are. And worship involves relationship. The uniting of our spirits with God's spirit in praise. And this may be spontaneous. Sometimes it is. When one suddenly comes to an awareness, and that happens to us at times, at least at the beginning. When one comes to a sudden awareness of God's goodness and grace, of his power and love, but more often worship is willed. As one chooses to humbly, joyfully, boldly, deliberately, lovingly affirm God's goodness and grace, his character, his holiness, his authority, his place in our lives, his place in the world. This is worship. And having said that, I tell you that as a teenager, while I knew of the Lord, and I would say I knew the Lord, and I sought to follow Jesus, it wasn't until I was in college, at a missions conference actually, that I first worshipped the Lord. 
I knew the Lord. I knew of the Lord. I knew the Lord for years before I ever worshipped the Lord. I went to worship, in other words, worship services almost every Sunday growing up, but I somehow never consciously, willfully, intentionally said to God, you are good, you are great, you are king, you are love, you are truth, you are holy, you deserve all that I have, everything that I have is from you and for you. Receive my grateful and abundant praise and love. Be glorified. I don't know where you are. Maybe you had that experience when you were 5 years old or 12 years old or 18 or maybe you never have. What is the chief end of man? Asked the first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, this teaching tool from the mid-1600s. What is our primary purpose? Sum it all up for me. Why do we exist? What is the chief end or purpose of humanity? And they answered that question to glorify God and enjoy him forever, to bring God glory and honor and majesty and praise and to find great joy in doing that. Huh. When the Israelites had been in bondage for 400 plus years in Israel, Egypt as slaves and Moses says to Pharaoh let my people go what is the reason that he gives so that they may worship their God over and over of course there are days and times when we become so caught up in our own lives and our own problems our own worries our own doubts that we don't feel like worshiping God what does one do then worship God Worship the one whose glory and goodness and worthiness are not affected by our moods or our thoughts or our sin or our unworthiness or our fear or our shame or our not having it together. The one who always stands at the door and knocks, the one who is always there like an eager, waiting, loving, reaching out, coming after us, Father, ready to embrace us. And this way of worship is a commitment and a discipline and an exercise. And one that emanates from a wonder-based gratitude to the God who salvages wrecked lives. Think of John Newton, the man who wrote Amazing Grace. And how natural and spontaneous worship must have been for him. When he realized that such a wretch he was, was saved by such a gracious God. For 2,000 years, the people of the way, people who are in Christ, who encounter the living God and Jesus, have gathered primarily on Sundays for worship. And the author of the book of Hebrews encourages the church and individual believers to not give up this practice, to continue to meet together regularly. Of course, it must be said that while sanctuaries are meant for worshiping God, sanctuaries were never meant to be the only place to worship God. The Magi worshiped Jesus in a house, Matthew tells us, or maybe outside that house. We can worship God in coffee shops and grocery stores and doctor's offices and fitness centers. We can worship God in our cars and on bicycles and on trains and on boats. This feels like a Dr. Seuss book. It's a little bitty book maybe some of you have read called The Practice of the Presence of God written centuries ago by a man named Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. How would you like to have that for a name? Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, The Practice of the Presence of God, where he, God, put on his heart resolved to worship and speak to and to live in the presence of God everywhere, all the time, doing his chores in the monastery, washing dishes, scrubbing floors, worshiping God continually. Having said that, however, I must also note the benefits of gathering physically and in one place for worship as a body, which is waning today, even more so because of pandemic. Admittedly, before the internet and the age of life scene, nevertheless, the great 16th century reformer Martin Luther wrote, at home in my house, there is no warmth or vigor in me. This is Martin Luther, people. 
at home in my house, there's no warmth or vigor in me. But in the church, when the multitude gathers together for worship, a fire is kindled in my heart and spirit, and it breaks its way through. Is that anyone else's experience 500 years later? Soren Kierkegaard, uh, 19th century Danish philosopher, theologian, thinker, existentialist, uh, said a lot of pithy and sort of provocative at his time things. And one of the things he noted to the church as a prophet of his time for his people was that the church is set up like a theater, which our church building sanctuary and most are as well. And in a theater, there are three primary roles. There are actors, there's a director, and there's an audience. And it's natural because of the way we're set up and the way we do things and the way the action happens that we think, oh, Shannon's the actor, God must be the director, and you're the audience. But Kierkegaard says that's all wrong. The church has had it all wrong. In reality, Stephen's the director. We in the pews, all of us are the actors, and God is the audience. The audience of one looking at our performance, not so good, but our action. What we say, what we do, how we are, who we are and specifically in relation to him. In his uh, book, uh, The Screwtape Letters, there's a chapter C.S. Lewis has where uh, the senior devil, if you will, is instructing the junior devil about how to deceive, mislead, tempt human beings. And in this chapter, he talks about the importance of the physical body for these human beings he's trying to lure away from the Lord. And he says, let them think that bodies don't matter. Let them think that their bodies don't count. They really do count. They really are important. It's a part of who the human beings are. It's inseparable from their spirit at this time. But let them believe it's not important. And so let them believe it doesn't matter how they are when they pray physically. Don't let them believe that their posture matters, that their physical bodies matter, because they really do lead them, tempt them, deceive them into thinking it doesn't, and they don't. Rewind to this word proskuneo, worship, worship, worship. And think most Presbyterians do a pretty good job of standing when asked to stand, and sitting when asked to sit, and holding the hymn book, at least in old times, and reading the words out loud. But the word proskuneo literally means to kiss the hand at its most literal, as you would kiss the hand of a king or a great person. It means to kneel, literally, to be down on one's knees. It means to lie prostrate before the Lord, In worship, how often do we do this? Our bodies matter because it's a part of who we are. And the scriptures call us to worship with our whole and entire selves. Richard Foster, classic book. I mentioned it periodically, Celebration of Discipline. I want to read just a couple of things for you out of it. God, chapter on worship. God calls for worship that involves our whole being. Often our reserved temperament is little more than fear of what others will think of us. Perhaps unwillingness to humble ourselves before God and others. Of course, people have different temperaments, but that must never keep us from worshiping God with our whole being. He goes on to say, in praise we see how totally the emotions need to be brought into the act of worship. 
worship that is solely cerebral. And I can almost translate that Shannon or Presbyterian. Worship that is solely cerebral is an aberration. Feelings are a legitimate part of the human personality and should be employed in worship. I like that. When Karen and I so many years ago were saying, where, God, do you want us? Where should we go? Where should we be? With what community? Where to serve? And we came into contact and a relationship with First Presbyterian Church San Mateo. And five things stood out to me at that time that were just really wonderful strengths of this congregation. The centrality of Jesus, the centrality of the scriptures, the commitment to children, the commitment to global missions, and this congregation's commitment to fervent worship, which I'm grateful continues today. Foster continues, singing is meant to move us into praise. And so when you're at home, as we say from time to time, we really encourage you to sing out loud. When you're in your car, when you're in the shower, when you're in the doctor's office, when you're in line at Trader Joe's, <laughs> let it fly. Singing is more than opening that hymn book and mouthing those words or just opening that hymn book and letting the people around you mouth those words. Singing is meant to move us into praise. It provides a medium for the expression of emotions. Through music, we express our joy, our thanksgiving. No less than 41 psalms command us to sing unto the Lord. Think about that. It's the hymn book of the people of God, Israel. 41 different psalms encourage God's people to sing. We would be remiss if singing, active singing, joyful singing, physical singing wasn't a part of our worship of God. And then to our whole beings, we have this thing which Sharon mentioned as she, uh, after she led us in prayer that we talk about giving our tithes and offerings. We don't pass the plate anymore, but we put that thing up on the screen and we do it here rather than through the mail or email because this is when we gather for worship. And we're reminded literally that as the Magi brought gifts, that was the tangible part in addition to showing up and bowing down of their worship. Almost as if we can't worship God without giving something that's of value to us to the one to whom has the greatest value of anything and everything. Doesn't need our stuff, but it expresses our worship. You may have heard someone say before, I didn't get much out of worship today. It's not about what you get out of it. It's about what we put into it. What did you put into? What did I put into? What did we put into worship this morning? We call it a service, but some people think that's spelled S-E-R-V-E-U-S. Serve us. But our service of worship is about and for serving Him, the Lord. All right, now back to the Magi and wrapping up. What were they doing? What were pagans doing in Matthew's narrative about Jesus? Worship. But what were pagans doing in Matthew's narrative? about Jesus' birth. Just as King Herod represented original sin as we talked about last night and sort of represents total depravity that Jesus came to redeem and save us from. Universal sin. So also the magi from the east, these pagans, these sorcerers, these magicians call all of the world to kneel before the infant at that time king who would redeem and save and love and heal and bless. They represent, they call, they speak to, they function in Matthew's narrative to call all of the world, east to west, north and south, every people, not tribe and nation, 
to bow before Jesus the King in worship. In chapter 14, halfway, exactly halfway through Matthew's gospel, for the first time, Jesus' disciples, who've been with him for these couple of years now, sort of get it. Like I sort of got it at a missions conference in college for the first time. They'd followed Jesus, obeyed Jesus, learned from Jesus, honored Jesus, maybe. But in chapter 14, for the first time, Jesus walking across the water, Peter, can I come to you? Peter runs out. Peter starts to sing. Jesus reaches out, rescues him. They climb back in the boat. And Matthew tells us that the disciples worshiped Jesus at that moment. Seeing who he was, knowing who he was, for the first time, they worshiped. Same word, proskuneo, Jesus. And then at the end, when we know, we, we quote the last few verses of Matthew's gospel. Uh, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you always. Very intentional, Matthew is, about the end of his gospel. But right before the end, two women go to the tomb, find it empty. Jesus is gone. Jesus, they don't know. They meet him on the road, the risen Jesus, and they proskuneo. They fall down and worship him. That's the response of people who have come into contact with God. A few verses later, the 11 encounter the risen and the living and the powerful and the loving and the good Jesus. Now post-resurrection, their response isn't to say, wow, nice job, way to go, fist pump. But they fell down and proskuneo, worship him. We as the church would be good and well off if we were to see in Matthew from beginning to end and right in the middle the testimony and the witness of the disciples not simply bearing witness to their faith with words but with their actions, with their hearts, with their songs, with their lives, with their gifts. They worshiped him. May the church, may our church, may we be so inspired. But Let us stand and with the Magi and together through song worship the Lord with our hearts, with our minds, with our souls, with our strength, with our bodies, with our voices, with our spirits in spirit and in truth, bringing to God as the author of the book of Hebrews sacrifices of praise. Let's stand together.